some kind of glasses here. Oh,
Why don't we have sound? Today is Sunday, June 7th, Trinity Sunday. And as I like to do, first a few housekeeping rules. If you haven't joined us before, your microphones are muted to cut down on confusion. But please continue to use your voice to participate this morning. Next, at the bottom or possibly at the top of your screen, you should find a chat box. If you click to open it, that's where you can type in any prayer requests that you might have this morning. This week, again, we'll be reading out of our own Bibles and having communion. So you might want to take a moment to fetch your Bible, a candle, and bread and juice if you haven't already prepared them um, right now so that you will have them ready as we go through worship. Our scripture readings this morning are Psalm 8 and from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Our hymns this morning are Holy, 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 and All Hail the Power of Jesus. This week, Nick and I attended an Akron Interfaith Zoom meeting to discuss the best preparations for to safely open our church doors to worship once again. Um, they brought us uh, the best wisdom based on the latest scientific findings, and um, we continue to get prepared as we um, get ready to open the church again in the coming time. And Brad and I met with a video expert to further explore uh, the best practices for streaming. Um, so that once we get back, we can be prepared to not only worship in person, but for those who are still um, wanting to uh, shelter at home, they'll be able to join us via Zoom. Um, consistory this week will meet on Thursday, not Tuesday. We'll be meeting on Thursday at 7 p.m. Um, due to a conflict in Brad's schedule. So I will be sending out a reminder, but I'm announcing it today. Don't show up on Tuesday. We won't be there Thursday. Um, and I'll resend the link for your convenience. And on Tuesday at 11 a.m., I'm going to host a special story time and discussion um, with our children um, via Zoom. So I will be sending out a link to everybody and posting it on Facebook uh, to, for the children to join. I'm sure they'll need uh, the grown-ups help to get online, but 11 o'clock on Tuesday, we're going to have a special, terrific uh, Tuesday kids, kids Zone, and I will be hosting it. So I hope you can turn in, tune in then. After service, you're welcome to grab a cup of coffee and hang out for our coffee hour. Um, we'll unmute everybody's mics at that time so that we can talk uh, to one another freely. So now let's take a minute and move into our time of worship. Let's put our right hand on our hearts and our left hand on our bellies. And we're gonna breathe in to the count of four and exhale to a count of more than four, just a nice slow exhale. Inhale to four and exhale to more than four. Breathing in the divine presence of God and breathing out any stress and anxiety. Breathing in God's peace and breathing out, releasing any worry. We're reminded that as we move through these times of reflection, that God is with us, ever drawing us near to the spirit of oneness and love. If you have a candle, take a moment and light it as I light the altar candles here on the altar. The 
flame of our candle represents the light of Christ and reminds us that Christ, as the Holy Spirit, is always with us and within us. And the candle also reminds us that regardless of what you and I were doing just moments ago, we've now entered into a sacred time. And we're reminded that we're never truly alone. Christ is here now as we worship and always within our hearts. Let's pray, shall we? Jesus, you promised us that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, there you will be also. So here we are, separated by space, yet gathered together in spirit and ready to worship you. Amen. So let's take a moment now and join in on Introit. Morning. Good morning. Please join me in please join me in the call to worship. Come into this household of the living God, the three in one. Gather in the wonder of the mystery that God has invited us to share in. We have come as the family of Christ, led by the Spirit of God. Ascribe to the divine glory and strength. Ascribe to God the glory that is due. Worship the triune God in the beauty of holiness. Our hope is that in this time of worship and learning, we might embrace what lies beyond our imagination and understanding. join me in the prayer of confession. Holy One, we acknowledge that too often we try to live not acknowledging the mystery of your being. Even though you have shown us your truth, we allow ourselves to rest in our own uncertainties. We find ourselves unable 
or unwilling to embrace the love through which you sent Christ to live among us. We take for granted the grandeur of you as creator, of Christ as redeemer, and of the Holy Spirit as ever-present sustainer. We do not live out the beloved community you desire for all. Forgive us, we pray, and help us give testimony to your love. Amen. Trust in these promises that the triune God in each of its faces promise us newness of life, a gift of new birth. The divine trinity invites us to testify to its being as the foundation for reconciliation of all God's people and for creation. In these truths, we trust and give thanks. Thanks be to God. Amen. During our Zoom worship, we have been setting aside a few moments each week to learn more about our Bible from the Bible Project folks. This week um, talks about the use of plot in the Bible. I'll be sending out a copy of this video later today for those of you who would like to view it again in more depth along with the study guide. But for now, let's take a look. We're learning how to read different types of literature in the Bible. And we're going to start by talking about biblical narrative. So narratives in their most basic form have characters in a setting going through a series of events. And how those events are selected and then arranged by an author, that's called the plot. A basic plot line begins with a character in her setting. But then something new or unexpected happens, causing problems that lead up to some ultimate conflict, which is then resolved and the character finds herself changed, living in a new normal. Now, in reading narratives, it's important to understand every scene in the context of its larger plot line. You can make the same story have a totally different message if you ignore where it occurs in the plot. This happens all the time when people read the Bible. Really? Yeah, take for example the story about Gideon. There's this well-known scene where Gideon's trying to discern whether God will help him win a battle, and he requests a sign from God. Yeah, Gideon lays a wool fleece on the ground and asks that in the morning the fleece be wet with dew, but the ground totally dry, and God does it. Now, if you look at this scene just by itself, what is the conflict. How can Gideon know if he'll succeed? And the resolution? Test God, ask for a sign, and find out. Yeah, and that's how many people actually read this story, and it totally misses the point, because it's ignoring the larger plot line. Really? Yeah, so let's start from the beginning, you'll get the context. The story begins with Gideon and the Israelites living in fear because they're oppressed by an invading people, the Midianites. Got it. Then there's the call to action. God commissions Gideon to defeat the Midianites and save Israel. Yeah, this is shaping up to be a good story. But then Gideon's super hesitant, so he asks God to do this magic trick, a sign, so I can know it's really you talking to me. And God stoops to his level. He gives him a sign by lighting this fire on an altar. So Gideon's already asked for a sign. And that's not all. In the next scene, God tells Gideon to tear down an altar to another god, but Gideon's so afraid, he does it at night. So Gideon's skeptical and also a bit of a coward. Then we come to the moment where Gideon's about to face the Midianites, and he's still uncertain, so he asks for another sign sign, the fleece. He says, I want to know if you'll save Israel by my hand. And God gives him that sign. And he's still uncertain. So he asks for even one more sign, which is just a variation of the previous sign. Okay, so Gideon's asking for way too many signs. Exactly. In the larger context, it's clear the plot conflict is not how can Gideon discern the mysterious will of God. The real conflict is when will this guy get his act together and start trusting God? Okay, so then what's the resolution? 
we have to keep reading. So Gideon gathers this huge army, 30,000 soldiers to fight the Midianites, and God says, no, way too many men. He whittles the army down to 300. Why would he do that? Well, Gideon's been testing God, so now God returns the favor. He tells Gideon to arm these 300 soldiers with trumpets and torches, and then surround the Midianites at night and make all this noise in the hills, which sounds ridiculous, but Gideon doesn't. And the noise it scares the Midianites into this frenzy. They start destroying each other in the dark while Gideon looks on safely from the hills. So this story isn't offering the reader tips for discerning God's will. No, it's about God's commitment to use weak people with deep flaws to do more than they could have imagined. Okay. So short scenes, like Gideon in the Fleece, are combined with other scenes making up a larger plot line. And tracing the conflict and resolution through the plot helps you see the message the author's trying to get across. Now, Gideon's story has been set alongside many other stories that are also about these flawed, often questionable leaders called judges. And each of these has its own internal plot line. But then altogether they make up a whole movement of the biblical story, the period of the judges, and that has its own unified plot line. And there are many movements within the story of the Bible. Exactly. And all the small smaller stories, hundreds of them. They fit within the context of their own movements, and then these movements together make up the building blocks of the grand plotline of the whole story of the Bible. So no matter where I'm reading in the Bible, I need to pay attention to these different layers of plot so I can read each story in context. Exactly. The Bible is such a sophisticated piece of literature, and so all these smaller plot lines keep overlapping, building up the tension, and when you back up, you can see how they've all been woven together into the unified story that leads to Jesus. Our first lesson this morning comes from Psalm 8. Listen now as the Spirit speaks to her church. O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. May God bless the reading and hearing of his word. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. Listen now for the word to God's people. Meanwhile, the eleven disciples were on their way to Galilee headed for the mountain Jesus had set for their reunion. The moment they saw him, they worshipped him. Some, though, held back, not sure about worship, about risking themselves totally. Jesus, though undeterred, went right ahead and gave his charge. God authorized and commanded me to commission you. Go out 
and train everyone you meet far and near in this way of life, marking them by baptism and in the threefold name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then instruct them in the practice of all I've commanded you, and I'll be with you as you do this day after day after day, right up until the end of the age. This is the word for God's people. May God bless all who hear it, who keep it, and who share it. Will you pray with me? May the words of my lips and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. So good morning. Today is Holy Trinity Sunday, the one Sunday of the church year in which it's wholly devoted to exploring and celebrating a theological idea. As a church, we take time once a year to specifically pause and to consider the many ways God is present and active and moving in our world. Perhaps in this turbulent time, you and I are called to encounter God here on earth as never before. Indeed, maybe it's ours to wonder what it means that you and I have been created, as the psalmist wrote, in God's image, just a little lower than God, bearing the face and breathing the very breath of God. Indeed, for now, I can't help but wonder if that might take us exactly where God intends us to be even now. At least I hope so, for as this moment, it's all I have right now. And, oh, I expect you've traveled much the same path that I have in these last days. We can be just even a little bit conscious right now and not simply be bowled over by so much going on in our country. And yes, so much of what I've encountered is pressed upon my own awareness in such a way that I consider the readings for this week in a way that I can't help but wonder how different the world would be if we all simply paused to see the face of God in one another. If we all just recognized the near divinity the essence, the almost as the psalmist would have it, holiness in every one of God's children. If with each breath we take, we sense the truth that its origin is the very breath of God within us. All around the world, people are standing up and using their feet and their voices to memorialize the scene that we witnessed on May 25th when George Floyd, child of God, as the psalmist said, just a little bit lower than God, had the very breath of God cut off for eight minutes and 46 seconds as bystanders looked on in horror and no one came to intervene. If only the man with his knee on George's neck had seen George's divinity, his holiness, his special as a child of God, things might have turned out much differently than it did. And these recent events called to mind an old parable called the rabbi's gift I'd like to share with you this morning. Long ago, there was a monastery in which had fallen on hard times. Its many buildings had once been filled with young monks, and its big church had resounded with the singing and prayers, but it was now almost deserted. People no longer came to be nourished by prayers and presence of the monks. Only five monks were left in the decaying mother house, the abbot and four others, all over the age of 70. Clearly, it was a dying order. The old, old monks shuffled through the cloisters and praised God with heavy hearts. But nearby on the edge of the monastery woods, an old rabbi had built a little hut and came occasionally to walk in the woods. One day, as he agonized over the imminent death of his order, it occurred to the abbot to visit the hut and ask the rabbi if by some possible chance he could offer any advice that might save his monastery. 
After morning prayers, he sent out through the woods. The rabbi warmly welcomed the abbot at his hut. But when the abbot explained the purpose of his visit, the rabbi could only commiserate with him. I know how it is, he explained. The spirit's gone out of the people. It's the same in my town. Almost no one comes to the synagogue anymore. So the old abbot and the old rabbi wept together. They read parts of the Torah and they quietly spoke of deep things. The time came when the abbot had to leave and they embraced each other. It had been a wonderful thing that we should meet after all these years, the abbot said but I still have failed in my purpose for coming here. Is there nothing you can tell me? No piece of advice you can give me that would help me save my dying order? No, I'm sorry, the rabbi said. I have no advice to give. The only thing I can tell you is that the Messiah is among you. You must only repeat this once, and after that, no one must ever say it again. Finally, the abbot and the rabbi exchanged an embrace, and the abbot returned to the monastery, pondering the words of the rabbi, the Messiah is among you. Whatever could the rabbi mean? Could Christ be the cantankerous brother William? Could Christ be mean and spiteful brother Stephen? Could Christ be the one young novice, petulant and withdrawn and still to be named? Who could Christ be? The abbot pondered all this, all afternoon and all night. When the abbot returned to the monastery, his fellow monks gathered around him and asked, Well, what did the rabbi say? He couldn't help, the abbot answered. We just wept and read the Torah together. The only thing he did say, just as I was leaving, it was something cryptic. It was that the Messiah is among us. And I don't know what that means. The monks were startled by this revelation. In the days and weeks and months that followed, the old monks pondered this and wondered whether there was any possible significance to the rabbi's words. The Messiah, one of us? Could he possibly have meant one of us monks here at the monastery? If that's the case, which one is it? Do you suppose he meant the abbot? Yes. If he meant anyone, he probably meant Father Abbot. He's been our leader for more than a generation. On the other hand, he might have meant Brother Thomas. Certainly Brother Thomas is a holy man. Everybody knows that Thomas is a man of light. But certainly he couldn't have meant Brother Elrod. Elrod gets crotchety at times. But come to think of it, even though he's a thorn in people's sides, when you look back at it, Elrod is virtually always right, often very right. Maybe the rabbi did mean Brother Elrod, but surely not Brother Philip. Philip is so passive, a real nobody. But then, Almost mysteriously, he has a gift for somehow always being there when you need him. He just magically appears by your side. Perhaps Philip is the Messiah. But of course, the rabbi didn't mean me. He couldn't have possibly meant me. I'm just an ordinary person. Yet, what if he did? Suppose I'm the Messiah. Oh, God, not me. I couldn't be that much for you, could I? They were deeply puzzled by the rabbi's teaching. But according to the instruction, no one ever mentioned it again. As they contemplated in this manner, the old monks began to treat each other with extraordinary respect on, and off, on the off chance that one of them might be the Messiah. And on the off off chance that each monk himself might be the Messiah. They began to treat themselves with extraordinary respect. Because the forest in which 
it was so situated was so beautiful, it so happened that people still occasionally came to visit the monastery to picnic on its lawn, to wander among some of its paths, even now and then to go into the dilapidated chapel to meditate. And as they did so, without even being conscious of it, they sensed the aura of extraordinary respect that now began to surround the five old monks and seemed to radiate out of them and just permeate the atmosphere of the place. There was something strangely attractive, but even compelling about it. Hardly knowing why, they began to come back to the monastery more frequently, to picnic, to play, to pray. And they began to bring their friends to show them this special place too. And their friends brought their friends. And it happened that some of the younger men who came to visit the monastery started to talk more and more with the old monks. And after a while, one asked if he could join, and then another, and then another. So within a few years, the monastery had once again become a thriving order. And thanks to the rabbi's gift, a vibrant center of light and spirituality in the realm. Friends, I believe this story is actually true, or at least has a core of truth. Christ is among us. Have you seen him? Look into your screen and see all the faces of your brothers and sisters looking back at you. Is he there? How about those protesters? Is he one of them? How about the very seat that you are sitting in? Could you be the one? Think about it. If everyone believed George Floyd was possibly the Messiah returning, could his God essence be so casually cut off by a knee while one's hands were in his pockets? Last week, we read how God's spirit swept through the early church, setting each person's heart on fire and enabling them to truly hear each other for the very first time. Perhaps we're finally starting to hear each other. Just like that ancient monastery, the world is beginning to recognize the sacredness of all of God's children, that we're all, we all have the divine breath within us. And that breath that God has given us in creating us just a little lower than God is meant for so much more, so very much more. Indeed, you and I have been called to be about creating a world in God's image of love, of hope, and of justice, where all who are imprinted with the image of God would know the wonder of these precious gifts. And you and I are called to be part of shaping a world where we use God's best gifts to protect one another from disease, every single one another. And you and I are called upon to love the young and the old, the strong and the frail, in such a way that the most vulnerable among us are not left without protection. Indeed, you and I are called to craft a world where all people, where all people are treated as just a little lower than God, where everyone is given the opportunity to be all that they were created to be, where no one goes hungry for food or dignity or hope. God gave us God's own breath for so much more than shouting slogans or whispering prayers, as vital and precious as these surely are. God gave us God's own breath that we might take life and make it possible for one another, that we might help each other flourish this Holy Trinity Sunday, let's look to understand the nature of God in the faces of neighbors, in the faces of friends, and yes, in the faces of strangers who are trying to build a world where all God's people are treated as only but a little bit lower than God. Won't you join me looking for that? 
Won't you come along and tell us where you've seen this to be so? May the certain truth that you've been created a little lower than God be both a gift and a call to you in these days to come. For this world needs the gift that you bring. May the breath of God continue to fill your own lungs that you speak and as you live, you might be a precious reflection of the very holiness of God. For you are and have always been filled with God's own. Soul. And all God's people said, Amen. God is the giver of life. Christ is the gift sent to share our life and the Holy Spirit, the power that enables us to continue in generosity, justice, and joy. Let us remember to send our tithes and offerings to the church through the mail or PayPal found on our Facebook page. And now will you pray with me? Today is Trinity Sunday on our calendar, O oh God, a day when we recognize the historical formulation of your nature as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We're humble Christians and don't always understand the depth of meaning in these old doctrines, yet we have experienced you in three ways in our own life as our heavenly parent that watches over and hears us as we pray. As our Lord Christ Jesus who taught us most of what we know about you. And died to show us your everlasting love. And as your Holy Spirit who is still at work in, in the world creating what is best and most meaningful in it. And encouraging us to live in a way to further your kingdom. We praise you, Lord, for these ways in which we know you and for the church, which through the ages has attempted to clarify our human experience of you and help us make sense of you. Teach us to be more sensitive about these manners and to care about their meanings. And as children grow and Learn more and more about parents who have borne that and kept them. Help us learn more and more about you and appreciate the aspects of you and your provision for us. And as we learn more, help us to care more about the world you've made and about your other children in this world. Make us more keenly aware of the hurt and the poverty of this world. Of people who are isolated and lonely who live under the curse of disease, those whose whole existence have been marginalized by where they were born and what kind of homes they come from, by their skin, their orientation, or their religion or lack of religion. Today, we especially lift up Valerie Hayden, Lisa and Jerry, Lynn Miller. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. David Cohen, Mary Jo Koo, Lauren Foreman. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And Rose. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we especially lift up all of those people who are speaking out in the name of George Floyd. We ask that there be calm in our streets, that they protest and use their voices peaceably, and that the virus that is plaguing our nation does not spread through their peaceful protests. Father, show us what to do with our resources so that at the end of our lives, we shall be happy with how we've used them and not be like the man with one talent 
who went out and buried it because he feared his master. Let our souls reflect the magnificence of the tr Trinity itself and let our hearts be inclined to you at all times. For you are our God, our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all this we ask in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. By the mysterious wonder of our triune God, we gather together to celebrate a feast that transcends all time and space, joining with Jesus and his disciples in an upper room with the church of all ages who have come here so often with sisters and brothers in faith all along the way, with people we know well and those we don't know at all. Here we trust that the mystery of God will become real. Here we gain a taste of the divine. And here we are fed as we go forth to serve the world. Come, all of you, and share in this feast of holiness and the wonder of God. May the Lord be with you. And lift, up your, you. lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God our thanks and praise. Let us pray. God, you reveal yourself in countless ways, even inviting us into the mystery of your inmost being where you are one in three and three in one. In your creation, you show us the marks of your hands and in creating us in your image, you call us to bear your very presence into the world. For your wondrous being and your glorious creation, we join our praise with the sound of all creation to joyfully sing and praise you in your wondrous glory. Just as we have known your presence and love in the gift of the Father and the Son, so, O oh God, reveal yourself to us in the wonder and power of your Holy Spirit. Pour out this spirit of love and hope on these elements of bread and wine that we might rise from this holy meal to love and serve the world. Keep us faithful in our service to you that we might give you glory and honor and praise forevermore. Amen. We remember that Jesus gathered at the table with his friends in a time of struggle and fear and he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it saying, take and eat, for this is my body. And after supper, Jesus looked forward to your desired day of joy. And he took the cup of wine and he blessed it. And he said, take this all of you and drink. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. I will share this meal with you again. In the reign of God, share this bread and this cup in memory of me. And now every time we share the bread like this and every time we share the cup, we remember Christ Jesus and his everlasting love. Come now, Holy Spirit of God. You are present in creation. Be present now. Friends, the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. The cup of the new covenant poured out for each of you. Drink in remembrance of Christ Jesus.
Will you pray the prayer of thanksgiving with me? Creator God, we give you thanks for the grain farmers, the bread bakers, the grape growers, the juice makers. Redeemer God, we give you thanks for all that we remember as we have shared this meal. Your birth, your life, your death, and your resurrection. Sustaining God, we give you thanks for the eternal presence of your spirit with us, surrounding us and filling us with divine life. May this meal we have shared renew us and inspire us to join more joyfully with you as you work for peace and justice in the world. Amen. And now I invite you to join with me in our closing hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. worship God by living. God is the source of love, so let us worship God by loving. God is the ground of being, so let us worship God by having the courage to be more fully human, using our sacred breath to, to create a just and compassionate world. Let us go in peace. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning.